In this video, I'm going to do a rapid review of the various types of glial cells. The reason that I was inspired to make a quick video on this topic is that I notice a lot of questions keep popping up about the various glial cells. And while this is a really small topic, the question seems to come up so often that I just wanted to make a quick video about it so that any of my subscribers watching this video would literally never get this question wrong again. So in this video, what we'll do is we will differentiate between the five types of cells you see on this slide here. And those include astrocytes, microglia, Schwann cells, oligodendrocytes, and ependymal cells. Before I get into this video, if you like the content that I'm making, please smash the like button, click subscribe, and share this video with your friends, whether you're in graduate school, medical school, nursing school, PA school, NP school, maybe you're even a resident or an undergrad student, it doesn't matter. Sharing it on your social networks helps get my video out there to more people for free quality education. So I really appreciate your help. So let's get started with astrocytes. Astrocytes are star-like cells that are responsible for the chemical environment for signaling. So in a nutshell, the primary function of astrocytes is to maintain the proper extracellular environment so that various other cells in the central nervous system can carry out their jobs. So you can think of astrocytes as playing a very supportive role. These are also involved in maintenance of the blood-brain barrier and they're involved in reactive gliosis. The term reactive gliosis is the catchphrase that refers to the changes you see in the brain after traumatic injury to the brain. And you'll see astrocytes in reactive gliosis and you'll also see the cell on the next slide, which is microglia. You're gonna see the presence of GFAP. I don't need to get into exactly what this stands for or what it does, what it means. All you need to know is that if you see GFAP, the answer is astrocytes. So astrocytes equals GFAP, just memorize that. Now, the thing about astrocytes is you wanna know that these are actually the most abundant cell in the brain and that they communicate via gap junctions. So all of these points on this slide with the exception of the GFAP thing, which you just need to memorize, basically tell you that astrocytes play a supportive role in the brain. They maintain the extracellular environment to support other neurons and other structures locally in the CNS. So those are astrocytes. Now the prefix astro, A-S-T-R-O, is star-like, right? Like astrophysics, right? Like the physics of stars and outer space and all that stuff that I don't know about. So astro equals star, shouldn't be a surprise to you that these are star-like cells. And the other thing that I like to memorize is that astrocytes are the stars of the extracellular environment. So they maintain that extracellular environment. So those are astrocytes. Now let's talk about microglia. Microglia are tiny cells, hence the prefix micro, and they're responsible for the process of phagocytosis in the central nervous system. So you can think of these as like the brain's macrophages. So these literally show up to the scene in reactive gliosis, like I said before, that occurs after some traumatic injury, and they act as scavengers. So they eat up all the things that need to get phagocytosed out of the brain. And these actually form reactive oxygen species. And you wanna know that because reactive oxygen species are used in the phagocytosis of foreign pathogens and foreign materials, but we also have some evidence that this process can actually lead to some neurodegenerative conditions. And reactive oxygen species in the brain have been possibly implicated in things like ALS and other CNS diseases. So the microglia definitely serve a purpose. They phagocytize anything that needs to get out of the central nervous system. They're involved in reactive gliosis and they form reactive oxygen species, which are supposed to be helpful, but maybe it's thought that when these cells act out of control, there's reactive oxygen species that form and actually can inadvertently damage the brain. And one more point that you wanna memorize, microglia are derived from the mesoderm. So, so far we've talked about two cells, astrocytes, the stars of the extracellular environment, astro means star, and microglia, micro meaning small, these are the small cells that are basically like your CNS macrophages. Now let's talk about the cells that are responsible for myelination. And there are two cells here. One is the oligodendrocyte and one is the Schwann cell. And we're gonna talk about them side by side because they're both responsible for myelination. And there's actually just one small difference between these two cells. So everything on the left part of this slide that you see in red will correspond to the oligodendrocytes. Everything that you see on the right side of this slide shown in blue will be for the Schwann cells. 
And so the first thing that you need to know is obviously these are both in, involved in myelin formation. So these are myelin forming cells. The big difference here is that oligodendrocytes do that in the central nervous system. So we're talking brain and spinal cord, whereas the Schwann cells do that in the peripheral nervous system. The other thing you want to know is that oligodendrocytes are derived from neuroectoderm, whereas Schwann cells are derived from the neural crest. And then for oligodendrocytes, you want to memorize that these cells are actually damaged in various leukodystrophies. So if you kind of flip forward in whatever textbook or question bank that you're using and you get to that part on leukodystrophies, part of the pathophysiology involves the destruction or the damage of the normal cells, the oligodendrocytes, that normally myelinate the central nervous system. And when you lose the ability to myelinate, you lose the ability to propagate signals adequately in the brain, and therefore you get the manifestation of neurologic disease. And the last really important and very high yield fact for oligodendrocytes is that under a microscope, these are said to have a fried egg appearance. And what that looks like is what you see here. Again, uh, I think that's a generous phrase. I don't know that I would say these look like fried eggs, but you know, certainly if you crack open an egg and fry the egg, you can, you can see somewhat of a resemblance. Now you need to memorize two things when it comes to oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells. One, for the oligodendrocytes, you need to memorize that it has the fried egg appearance because that's a buzzword that's high yield and gets thrown out all the time. And for Schwann cells, you actually need to memorize that they're derived from neural crest. The reason being is that when you're taking an exam, you want to memorize that Schwann cells come from the neural crest and oligodendrocytes come from something else that's not the neural crest. So there's really, I think, it only makes sense to memorize one of them. So if you memorize Schwann cells equals neural crest, then if you were taking an exam and they gave you neuroectoderm, you'd be like, oh, well, it's not Schwann cells because I know that's neural crest. Therefore, it's gotta be oligodendrocytes because these are similar but different. So with that in mind, there are two mnemonics I wanna give you. For oligodendrocytes, memorize oligodendrocytes, which tells you about the fried egg appearance. And when I think about Schwann cells, it kind of sounds like swan. And swans have those crests or, the, or those really prominent beaks. So I think of the Schwann's crest. And that helps me memorize that Schwann cells are derived from neural crest. So oligodendrocytes and the Schwann's crest. Those tell you very, very high yield things. And then if I was taking the exam and they asked me where do oligodendrocytes come from, I'd be like, all right, well, it doesn't come from the crest, the neural crest, because that's the swan or the Schwann's crest. So I know it's the other thing that sort of sounds like neural crest, therefore it's gotta be the neuroectoderm. So those are very, very high yield points. Make sure you memorize those. The last cell we need to talk about are ependymal cells. Now ependymal cells are actually cells that are involved in CSF regulation. So they line the ventricles and they can either be simple columnar or simple cuboidal cells. And if you've done any histology, and I'm making you go back in time now to your first year of medical school or, or NP school, PA school, et cetera, you know that columnar and simple cuboidal cells functionally are involved in fluid regulation, depending on which cavity they're lining. So ependymal cells are involved in CSF regulation. And the apical surface of the ependymal cell contains cilia and microvilli. So the little hairs are literally like ushering the CSF along, helping to maintain that fluid compartment. Now you absolutely need to memorize this function. So my mnemonic here is that the CSF depends on ependymal. And you see that in depends, there's E-P-E-N-D, append for ependymal. So the CSF depends on ependymal. And that's it guys, really, really fast. I told you this was gonna be a rapid review. Here is your summary table for your reference. I didn't put my astrocyte mnemonic in here, but just remember astro equals star. And these are the stars of maintaining that extracellular environment. All egg odendrocyte for fried egg appearance. Swan's crest for Schwann cells coming from the neural crest, and CSF depends on ependymal cells. Hope this was helpful. Good luck.